I think it's about time. Okay, I think we can, um, more people are still waiting to come in. We can wait a little bit. Um, okay, I think we'll start. Um, still have people, so um, we'll have uh, people waiting. So let's uh, wait a bit uh, longer so other people can properly seated. That's everybody joined. I uh, still have uh, two more here, I think. Uh... All right, I think uh, people will be trickling in. Well, um, first of all, um, hello everybody. And um, thank you for joining in this, uh, um, our first talk of this migration lecture series. Um, so I'm Gracia Liu Ferrer, I'm a professor at the uh, Graduate School of Asia Pacific Studies. And uh, this semester, actually, we're going to have uh, um, several exciting um, lectures. And we have this theory called Mi Mi Migration Lecture Theories. I think um, um, all of you are on our mailing list. So please uh, stay tuned for the announcements that are coming. Um, today, uh, we have, uh, it's, it's my great, uh, honor and I'm uh, very excited to introduce you, Professor uh, Christian Yop. Uh, Professor Christian Yop is, uh, is a very um, um, esteemed political sociologist uh, who is a professor and chair in sociology at the University of Bern, uh, Switzerland. But he has uh, taught and researched at the many other institutions including University of Southern California, European University Institute, University of British Columbia, International University Bremen, and American University of Paris. I think I'm, I'm very envious of uh, his opportunity to, to be um, you know, working at so many exciting, uh, great institutions. He has also held research fellowships at the Georgetown University and the Russell Sage Foundation, New York. He has authored more than 100 publications, monographs, and manuscripts, and is among the most widely cited authors in the field of uh, citizenship and immigration. And uh, I read uh, some of uh, his uh, previous um, books, uh, including this a very widely read uh, book called Citizenship and Immigration that published by Cambridge. Uh, by Polity Press um, 2010. I think it's a textbook used in many places. But I came across his uh, new book called Neoliberal Nationalism, Immigration and the Rise of the Populist Right. It's also published, uh, it's published by Cambridge University Press uh, last year. So when I read this book, I was very excited and uh, I thought that book seems to address a lot of the uh, questions that we have been uh, facing and some of the research uh, topics that we have been, you know, um, uh, engaged in. So I, I invited him to uh, give a talk and he kindly agreed. So today uh, he's going to, um, I, I think, uh, give us some of the, you know, his um, key points of this book. And also I, I mentioned to him that the, a lot of our audience um, actually our uh, work in Japan and, and in Asia. So I think it would be great to have a conversation about some of uh, his uh, um, theories and arguments. So I think without further ado, I think uh, let's uh, welcome uh, Professor Yok to, uh, to give us this talk. Thank you. Uh, uh, Christian? The yeah, screen is yours. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Gracia, for this uh, 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 generous uh, introduction. Uh, I uh, prepared a few slides, which I hope to you can see them. 
good. <clears throat> yes. And I can be heard properly. I don't have to put on my earphone. I don't like to look somebody body snatched from Mars <laughs> with earphones. Uh, I prefer to just be freestyle. Okay. You sound it very works. clear. Very good. Very good. You know, uh, yeah. uh, it's this one. Uh, uh, it, if you like my uh, populism book, uh, it is a reflection on the double shock of 2016. Uh, the double shock meaning first uh, Brexit in June and uh, the Trump presidency five months later. And, uh, you know, uh, as a sociologist, you always take the liberty also to uh, be in the shadow of the zeitgeist and to move with the themes of the time. And uh, I just had to do something on, on populism. And populism was the uh, buzzword of the time, of course, the breakthrough of populism. The economists uh, called them the new nationalists at the time, uh, with the Donald as a drum beater all in front, and Nigel Farage and, and, and other uh, foot soldiers uh, near him. Um, uh, so, um, and of course, I didn't uh, stray too far from my uh, domain, which is the domain, uh, Gracia mentioned it, of immigration policy, of, of citizenship policy. I have been grazing that, that meadow uh, for, uh, for some uh, decades. So, what is the impact of, of that double talk on, on these policies? So that, that is the question. Does it uh, mean the end of liberalism? That's a rather dramatic uh, uh, title of, of the final chapter of this book. Um, and to a degree. Yeah. It's very noisy then, the background. I still can be heard. Well, actually, as a PhD student in my journey, I don't have to. So take your phone. It's extremely noisy in the background. No, no it's a bit I, have, I think it's one of the participants that forgot to mute the. Oh, okay. Computer. So I have just uh, um, uh, muted. Oh. <laughs> Please, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> You're the boss, uh, Garcia. <laughs> um, so uh, it's also this book uh, um, a self. Uh, a correction or you know looking back at your own uh, struggles over the years and I uh, previously looked at immigration policy and citizenship policy from the vantage point of advancing liberalism you know? um, in the context of immigration most <clears throat> concretely that uh, newcomers are no longer selected by origins. That was the title of the book in 2005, Selecting by Origins. They are now selected uh, not on group level, but uh, individual level, uh, on the basis of individual level categories, no longer group level categories, you know, no longer racial, racializing, racist, ethnicizing uh, um, um, uh, modes of, of, of selection. Uh, in a nutshell, immigration policies are argued in that book has become non-discriminatory um, and in that respect uh, more uh, uh, liberal. Now, obviously, uh, the double shock forces you to complexify that landscape a little bit, as obviously there is not just advancing liberalism, it's actually something uh, counter uh, force to liberalism that seems to complicate uh, the scene. So, Two new factors have to be um, um, included. <clears throat> uh, on the one side, of course, most obviously, the new nationalism, populism, I use these terms here interchangeably, even though there is a long uh, debate about which is the most appropriate concept to use. Um, but <clears throat> uh, Neo-nationalism and populism in a neoliberal context, mm -hmm. and the more I went about uh, reading sources and uh, following court cases and uh, and and uh, new uh, parliamentary uh, interventions, the, the usual claptrap of 
in a way, institutionalist analysis. But the, the more I uh, proceeded in that, I noticed the less important, actually, the, the populists, the, the less important uh, uh, nationalism, and all the more important, something I had not previously looked at seriously enough, neoliberalism as something being distinct from liberalism. When, whenever I reflected on liberalism in the past, very often I really meant neoliberalism without being explicit about it. And my latest challenge in, 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 in my scholarly work, if you want to use a bombastic term for that, is, is just to, to map the distinction between these two forces, principles, um, more clearly than it is usually done. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> immigration policy today, uh, and not looking at any one country, basically looking at rich OECD societies, uh, preferably with the liberal with a liberal uh, trajectory, um, all look alike. Um, they all um, uh, proceed in terms of a, a dualism, if you like, um, courting the top. Uh, laying out red carpets for the best and brightest, uh, the most meritorious individuals, uh, and erecting hurdles, I call it, fending off all the rest, all the bottom. And how to categorize the bottom is um, a question I will go into in, in, in a second. Um, so, um, to me, immigration policy is is really in terms of this duality, and I do think um, uh, neoliberalism alone already accounts and uh, can describe and to a degree also explain this duality. You, you don't need populism and new nationalism. Uh, it has, you know, uh, scrabbled yet the edges of that, particularly making the uh, fending of the bottom exercise uh, um, a lot harder and a lot nastier here or there in some countries such as the Netherlands or Denmark where these uh, parties have been stronger than other countries but they have not they have not created this duality this um, um, uh, binary of uh, courting the top and uh, fending off uh, the bottom having said that um, What actually is liberal? What, what should actually a liberal immigration policy be if, to me, the new a neoliberal constellation is that binary or this flag? Um, and uh, my starting point here was really very concretely reading, uh, reading The Economist, the most important, uh, it's not so clear whether they are liberal or neoliberal voice um, uh, in, 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 in rich societies. They, they had a summary article in uh, 2000, I have to observe the time as well, yeah. They had a summary article in 2018 uh, reflecting on what is the way forward to, to uh, uh, for, for, for a liberal, a good, uh, <coughs> a productive immigration policy. And um, the, <coughs> the headline of all of that was the fear of immigration, I, it's here on the slide, is poisoning Western politics. Liberals are losing the debate. And it's interesting to look at the diagnosis of the economists at the time uh, of, of, of what that fear consists of and why liberals are losing the debate. So the liberal diagnosis is, yeah, we don't have enough uh, channels for uh, newcomers to be admitted. Uh, we have very narrow skill um, and family channels. I didn't mention the asylum, that would be the third one here. But everybody knows the family channel has been worked on in a restricted direction now for actually uh, way before populist parties were on the map since 2030 uh, or perhaps even more years. Same for asylum. Still, Really, only the high skilled, um, we will talk about the low skilled component uh, in a second. 
So as there are so many channels available, people try their luck by posing as refugees. It's very interesting. What the economist uses here is the typical populist uh, notion of uh, uh, asylum uh, seekers as fake asylum seekers. Uh, 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 very interesting. The same language they try their luck by posing as refugees. Of course, this is not as nasty in its formulation as it could be by a card carrying populist. Uh, furthermore, the, uh, the economist is, is, is fully uh, aware that the biggest benefits actually from international migration is for migrants themselves. And uh, I think that is confirmed by a lot of uh, economists, uh, not the economists, but professional economists uh, uh, work on, on that topic. So, and there are just two alternatives, uh, as well as the economist. Uh, um, of course, you can admit more low-skilled, uh, unskilled uh, people for which, unfortunately, there is little need in uh, post-industrial service economies and against which, as we know, there is much uh, opposition. Um, so perhaps that's not the best alternative. And the second alternative is to uh, enforce asylum rules uh, more strictly uh, than before, not in in order not to create false incentives uh, for adverse selection, as some call it. Uh, um, so the economist's recommendations then, uh, at the bottom of the page, you can see that um, migration can make the world richer, and they quote one economist who argues if there would be no border control, the GDP would double. No idea how economists come up with that sort of uh, uh, wizardry. Uh, well, with their metrics, I cannot compete. I leave it to themselves. Uh, um, and um, yeah, indeed, type controls will be necessary. Even lesser rights, the economist invokes, not in uh, word, but in meaning, that um, uh, dilemma which Martin Ruiz uh, pointed out that numbers versus rights is. Um, it's just kind of a key dilemma here. Either you admit people in, in large numbers, uh, uh, then the cost of that is you cannot give them many rights, or vice versa. And he screens the world's migration states from the point of view of the, that dilemma. is differently resolved in uh, different areas of the world, from the Gulf states to the uh, to the European more liberal uh, states. So. All that is not so liberal at all. Um, just following um, uh, the intelligent voice of liberals around the globe, uh, they quote Marshall Australia. Isn't that interesting? And uh, they say in that article that's not on the slide now Australia's unusually open immigration policy, it's true about more than 20-25% um, of the residence population in Australia are foreign born, is underpinned, made possible by toughness. And of course, what they don't mention here, but have in mind, is, is the atrocious uh, um, outsourcing them to this Nauru island there in an extra uh, juridical zone where they can uh, house these poor guys like uh, con concentration camp inmates. Uh, uh, successive governments made it clear that Australia decides who can or cannot come. Okay. Um, one should give the title to this slide here, The Difficulties of Being Liberal, and I actually did it, but obviously I uh, didn't say it uh, that far. Now, um, before one even starts reflecting on immigration policy, one must um, be conscious of the fact that this is a policy that by definition, by nature, uh, must be restrictive. Um, and it's very interesting here to quote a uh, late 19th century liberal um, from a textbook, actually, Elements of Politics, widely read at the time, uh, Henry Sidwit, um, um, in by heart a cosmopolitan, but he concedes actually the world is politically organized, not on cosmopolitan, but on uh, national uh, principles, he calls it the national ideal, 
uh, rules, uh, uh, politics, domestic and international, and unfortunately, not personal policy. And, and uh, immigration policy in this regime, he describes um, a state obviously must have the right to admit aliens on its own. Today, no liberal would dare calling uh, uh, immigrants aliens. Uh, and I continue that quote, which uh, I didn't have on the um, slide here. Um, uh, why do I have it? But, uh, yeah, yeah, I have it. But imposing any conditions on entrance or any tolls on transit and subjecting them to any legal restrictions or disabilities that it may deem expedient. The state may do all that. If it may legitimately exclude them, these aliens, altogether, it must clearly have a right to treat them in any way, whatever, after due warning given and due time allowed for uh, with withdrawals. Um, uh, what is the function of this brutish uh, late 19th century uh, liberal picture of immigration policy? Well, Fitwick says this is good for internal cohesion. And secondly, it helps to raise the standard of the poorer classes. Not so different today, except that to raise the standard of the poorer classes is not really any longer a goal of immigration policies. At least uh, corporations have withdrawn from that front, and that may uh, actually uh, explain. Uh, Increasing uh, uh, problems on, on that front. An interesting book has been written about that by Margaret Peters, a labor economist, uh, uh, not long ago. Uh, well, I could uh, move on here. Yeah. Aristide Solberg has a very similar uh, skeptical uh, in this great book on America by design uh, analysis. Uh, um, um, a counterpoint to that, and now I'm already in the business of uh, reviewing uh, uh, current theories of, 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 of immigration and its changing features, an interesting counterpoint to all this um, realist uh, restrictivism uh, from Sedgwick to Zolberg, as it was, been set by Gary Freeman in a very, very uh, influential think piece. Um, um, uh, and he argues that actually immigration policies are broadly expansionist and inclusive. And he has a soft rational choice argument to explain that. Interestingly, uh, he, when uh, coming up with that think piece that really has been extraordinarily influential, uh, not, not just for, for me, but for, for legions of, of writers in that field, he has been totally silent on the uh, high skilled versus low skilled distinction, and that that may uh, give rise to rather differently um, uh, a structured uh, immigration uh, policy. More recently, uh, a Dutch uh, scholar, uh, Hein de Haas, uh, with some uh, uh, um, junior uh, fellow authors, came up with a big review piece comparing some 40 OECD countries um, and how they do broadly conceived immigration policies. And he came out with the uh, conclusion that these policies have actually not become that much more restrictive in a, in a neo-nationalist uh, populist uh, climate. What really um, um, has changed the pictures a bit is that these policies have become increasingly complex, not really more restrictive, but increasingly complex and overall more skillful focused, a much bigger fine tuning, fine grading according to skill and having different programs for different um, uh, skill profiles. Migrants. Um, likewise, a more qualitative um, around the world the comparison has been done by the uh, Canadian scholar Catherine Dovania, who teaches at, uh, at British Columbia. 
and, and uh, she, she, she gave the picture of immigration policies becoming increasingly mean spirited, she calls it. Uh, um, she draws the same dualism uh, that, that I uh, draw in, in my book, and actually, partially, I got the idea for that uh, from, from her. But she's at the same time conceding these policies, even they may have become a bit a touch mess, yeah, they're still non discriminatory. It's no return to group level um, race or race this, uh, um, selecting by origin, as it may have been the case before the 1950s. And she, yeah, uh, I'm very sorry. It seems like there is an echo on your side, and some I think it's difficult, sometimes muffled and difficult to hear. Is it would it be better if you could uh, use I'm sorry for her? <laughs> Somehow, I mean, it's a uh... I cannot hear that echo at all, but let's see. Yeah, I get, I guess it's, um, I don't know, maybe the. The headphone will be uh, slightly more helpful. Sorry for put you in that. Is it better now? Oh yeah. Is, is it better for everybody? Say something again. <laughs> yeah, it's I much can. better. Okay, great. Well, I'm sorry. I also to good. you. Uh, I I was in the assumption I can be heard um, uh, properly. Uh, okay. Yeah, I will not repeat all that sermon now. Um, <laughs> maybe you. We mostly could... heard fine, just like there are several uh, words that will be muffled. So now it's, ah, uh, everything okay. is clear. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I would have preferred to come to Tokyo, of course, you know, but because it was Gracia who invited me, I uh, because usually I, I hate these Zoom talks uh, to 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 my. All right, we will uh, inv in we'll the depth invite of... over. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> <excited>. <laughs> right. Go ahead. Sorry. To round up this uh, review of current uh, theories and uh, debates, um, an interesting new, uh, very uh, large N analysis, uh, quantitative analysis, has been done by an Australian uh, scholar and an American scholar, um, uh, Anna Boucher and uh, Justine Guest. Uh, um, and they actually argue. Uh, it's also a 40 plus country comparison around a kind of rich world, always OECD talking only. Yeah? Um, and they argue uh, now it's not so much a liberal model a la Gary Freeman. Um, it's a market model uh, that is dominant in, uh, in, 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 in these rich societies. And the market model, they also call it neoliberal actually, um, is labor focused uh, with this obsession about getting the high skilled. Uh, it is very nasty and restrictive on um, family migration. So you have here that duality of uh, uh, courting the top and uh, fending off the bottom. Um, there is a preference for temporary migration. Already Katrine Dauvergne had seen that and she even entitles her book um, The End of Settlement uh, with a big nostalgic note that um, the classic uh, nation building by immigration countries like her own Australia, uh, Canada, United States, they no longer look for future citizens, but uh, you know, for they no longer need people, they need widgets, as she says, kind of uh, screws in a, in a mechanism, uh, what is useful uh, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the respective uh, economy. So um, these countries, uh, predominantly, I will go back uh, back to that point uh, later. Th they preferentially recruit temporary migrants, even at the very high skilled level, and then they have to prove themselves um, whether they really deserve to get uh, a permanent residency and then eventually, of course, a citizenship. So part of the market model is a preference for temporary migration. Finally, this is very broadly conceived immigration policies in the Boucher guest model. It also includes citizenship policy. And here they point out citizenship is uh, increasingly less important. Uh, there are rather low naturalization rates um, and broadly overall lesser rights for migrants. And particularly as you go down the skill ladder, um, 
um, the more <laughs> lesser these rights uh, become. So um, I move, I'm already half an hour. I think I have only 15 minutes left, Garcia, is that correct? You have more than that, so. Okay, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yeah, um, I give you the immigration policy spiel of that book. There's also a citizenship policy spiel, which I actually find more interesting because I found a nice term for neoliberal uh, citizenship policy. I called it earned citizenship against the old idea, liberal idea that citizenship is a right. Now the new rhetoric is it's a privilege that has to be earned. Um, I didn't find uh, such a neat, nice uh, two word formula on the side of immigration policy, but uh, I guess you are all more interested in immigration and therefore I stick to that uh, side of the game here. <clears throat> um, um, immigration policy in, in the neoliberal context is that is something to be emphasized again and again, always policies in the plural, because the legal infrastructure of rolling out carpets is very contrary to the legal infrastructure of, and the whole logic of building barricades, building uh, uh, buffers, um, <clears throat> for example, with respect to uh, family uh, unification rights, High-skilled people, um, of course, their spouses, married or not, are uh, always allowed to move with labor, but on the low-skilled side, that is increasingly difficult even to have nuclear family members uh, joining uh, uh, you. You know, this duality, um, is a neoliberal duality. And in the literature, who comes closest to see that uh, is uh, Loic Vacan, uh, little wizardry uh, Bourdieu inspired uh, sociologist who teaches at UC Berkeley. And he has written a very uh, polemical and uh, energetic pieces uh, about punishing the poor and about workfare, uh, welfare to workfare policies um, in North America and uh, in Europe. And he calls the emergent neoliberal state a centaur state, according to the uh, half horse, half human being uh, animal of, uh, of, of, of Greek uh, uh, mythology. Uh, the centaur state is endlessly generous at the top and is penal, punishing, and carceral at, at uh, the bottom. Um, I cannot go into uh, this metaphor, but it's a very neat metaphor that actually is, is, is exactly uh, uh, parallel to this uh, dualism that I find in the field of immigration policy. Uh, Vacan looks again at social policy. It's a different uh, field, of course. <clears throat> now, courting the top, um, indeed, the logic is to solicit flows where none so far exists in a context in which demand always exceeds supply. So a competitive logic kicks in. Uh, the, the first to have noticed that is Ayelet Shachar, um, um, an Israeli-Canadian can uh, lawyer who has written about the race for talent, one of the first comparative pieces on, on, on high skilled immigration policy. And, and, and she calls the regimes uh, that are in this game competitive migration regimes. And th that is exactly uh, the, the right uh, uh, concept uh, to use here. As the flows at the top are small and to be created rather than already existing. This is a policy that is not politicized at all. I don't think anyone um, in rich societies with such policies opposes them, except maybe the green do-gooders of oil, the dispossessed and uh, 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 
exploited in the world. But interestingly, populists have no problem with high-skilled immigration. And in an older party program of the Alternative for Germany, the German uh, variant of uh, right-wing populism, they all celebrate model, of course, they also celebrate the model Australia, and that's the nastiness towards asylum seekers, but they do celebrate positively, um, also positively, uh, but positive, positive, as it were, the model Canada with, with its point system and its preference for high-skilled uh, people. I will go into Canada in, 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 in a sec. So fending off the bottom is not solicit flows where none existed so far. It is stemming flows that are already there. And demand here, uh, excuse me, the supply uh, in a way for vacant uh, admission spots, the supply always exceeds demand. It's the exact opposite as uh, with respect to high-skilled immigration. Uh, so this is a policy that is always, always, and by nature restrictive. Um, there's a nice chapter by uh, political economist uh, Yaktish, um, oh, what's his name, um, Bavati or so, an Indian scholar who teaches at Columbia University. And he wrote a very good book um, in the beginning of the uh, new millennium uh, in defense of globalization. Bhakwati is his name, Yak, Yaktish Bhakwati, who, who, who actually um, uh, uh, does this synopsis and, and I'm in his, uh, in his wind sh shadow here uh, using even the terms. <clears throat> um, and as fending off the bottom reacts to flows that are already there, it is always highly politicized, always highly politicized against the notorious low level of politicization um, at the top. And, and all the energy of populists and nationalists are, are at the bottom level, of course, right? To, uh, uh, to, to get uh, these unwanted uh, migrants out. Now, this uh, binary, really does away with previous categorizations of migration regimes. This binary can be found from Korea, and I would even think Japan, I know a little bit less about Japan than Korea, to France, Germany, Canada. What is obsolete is a, a, a frame that I myself used in my first immigration book uh, called uh, Immigration and the Nation State, published now <laughs> 23 years ago, in the last year of the old uh, millennium. And, and there I distinguished between three types of migration regimes, guest worker, Germans, post-colonial, classically the Brits, and settler regimes, classically the United States. And that was the three country comparison along these uh, three uh, cases. It's totally obsolete, that's anachronistic. That's as museal uh, interest by now, but it's, uh, it's not describing what's going on today. And what has become obsolete is, well, as long as I've worked in the field, there was always, we have, all have to learn from model Canada. Canada, they are the best, they are just, the nicest, they are the most intelligent, the most ethical, or oh, why can the whole world not be Canadian? And also that uh, settler regimes set a liberal norm for the others to follow is increasingly uh, anachronistic. Courting the top. The origins of all of that is, of course, the Canadian point system, uh, first uh, introduced in 1967. In Europe, that arrived with a long, long delay of some 30 years. Um, not really before the late 1990s have they become uh, engaged in recruiting high-skilled uh, immigrants and, of course, globalization really beginning in earnest after the breakdown of communism is, is the critical watershed here. There are two pioneers in Europe, uh, the UK and Germany. I, 
in my book describe both cases. Uh, it, interestingly, under third way leftist governments, uh, these uh, new high school policies were introduced. And of course, you know what third way leftism means. It is actually the left going neoliberal and buying into uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh the, the secret charm of of markets as enriching all of us and through trickle down also the poor this kind of uh, cosmic lie uh, that uh, neoliberals have been spreading since 30 years the, the left uh, 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 embraced that lie uh, under uh, clinton in the united states tony blair uh, in the UK and Schröder in, in Germany. And under Blair, this uh, managed migration was the big buzzword under Tony Blair. And that was a fundamental reorientation of British immigration policy up to then. It followed simply the imperative, uh, let nobody in, essentially. Um, uh, immigrants are a threat to cohesion. And uh, Blair... Um, was trumpeting, uh, uh, we are now in competition for the brightest and best talents, as his uh, 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 immigration minister, Barbara Roche, uh, put it uh, at, at the time. Uh, and, and Germany did the same thing. Um, in, in the UK, it was interestingly more for political scientists, how, what are the mechanisms that kicks in uh, 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 news uh, in the UK, it was autonomous governments doing it, Blair, and in Germany it was industry pressure because there was a scarcity of uh, uh, high-skilled people, particularly in the famous IT uh, uh, sector. And uh, I go a little bit through the history of it here. Uh, I will not bother you with the detail. Uh, the green card was indeed uh, uh, used, the English word green card, the first very cautious uh, high-skilled recruitment scheme under Gerhard Schröder, social democrat, third way, um, uh, neoliberal social democrat at the time. There was a total failure because they, they just completely misunderstood that with respect to high-skilled immigration, you compete. And, and, and they still applied that logic uh, um, keep them out in a way. For example, with the green card uh, scheme, um, these high-skilled uh, folks from Bangalore and India were not allowed to bring their partners, not even their spouses. I mean, who, who does that kind of nonsense, goes to the low skies of uh, uh, miserably temperatured Germany, everybody's unfriendly. You, you, go, you go to Silicon Valley, you know, where the weather is nice and where people uh, welcome you. So total failure. They couldn't fill all these uh, 30,000 just slots. Um, the Zuwanderungsgesetz in 2005 was a halfway house uh, in the direction of being more open for high-skilled people. And there is some, uh, well, I will not go into Article 19 here. Um, uh, uh, interestingly, um, in 2012, with uh, implementing the uh, European Union uh, blue card scheme, uh, that is a high skilled uh, um, uh, uh, scheme uh, in the EU that doesn't replace uh, EU politics is very complicated, also immigration field, it, it, it doesn't replace national rules and uh, policies, but it's an additional layer to them. The Germans were basically the the best Europeans, they really implemented it. And I think until the present day, about 80, 90 percent of uh, uh, um, uh, people moving in under the EU blue card scheme actually enter uh, Germany. And they introduced an interesting new paragraph. L few people notice it, the 18C into their residence law. That gives all diploma holders in the universe, um, the right to enter Germany for six months, okay, strings are attached, you are not allowed to put up work, uh, kind of to, uh, to work during these six months, and it's limited to six months. Um, but everybody with a bachelor degree has in principle the right to enter Germany if you just have your family funds, look for work, and then settle 
down. It's a very interesting, <laughs> very big openness. You know, it goes that far that um, uh, I was for a while a member of the uh, expert council on uh, integration and uh, uh, migration here, SVR, S -V -R, it's uh, the acronym to advise governments at various levels in Germany on immigration and integration policy. And, and we came to the conclusion, you know, the, the rules are so, um, call them liberal now, open for high-skilled people, that just adequate marketing is, is the biggest problem, that not enough bachelors around the world have understood they can move to Germany and put up tent, okay, with these strings attached. And they are, of course, not small strings. That is not to be um, uh, denied here. Um, the, the real... Um, um, uh, the first self-conscious immigration law in Germany ever passed was in 2018, went into force 2019, the so-called Fachkräfte-Einwanderungsgesetz. That, in a way, um, is opening the country, not just for university degree holders, but for, um, say, uh, what in Germany is called Handwerker. Uh, people with uh, with plumbers uh, with with the plumbing certificate, you know that 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 you went through an apprenticeship in in, in plumbing or in uh, uh, lumberjacking, uh, whatever is 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 the craft. Uh, Fachkräfte really means middle level, below university level, prof kind of crafts uh, education there's a big big demand uh, in in germany there because germany is a country that has not deindustrialized luckily that's part of the reason they're doing quite well they kept industries in in their country unlike unlike the french neighbor they they sold off alstom under macron and sold off everything industrial and therefore they have big big problems now actually uh with unemployment and low uh, salaries and all of that well okay that's a different story the German story, last word on that. Now everybody says in Germany, wir sind ein Einwanderungsland. That happened cautiously already in the late 1990s. Then it was ever more. Today, there is nobody seriously except the ultra-right front uh, around the AFD who would not share in this, uh, we are an Einwanderungsland, we have to be uh, friendly towards newcomers, willkommenskultur, uh, which actually was tested uh, during the refugee crisis. I will not go into that. I cover it in my book. Okay, enough uh, for Germany. And I think I should, mm, I, I in a way have two more slides, rush up a little bit. Grace, Grace Gracia, how many minutes do you give me? It's, it's okay because we spent quite a time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Canada. Uh, well, yeah, they started the point system. Um, but interestingly, ever since, they moved in a rather opposite, more European direction. To a degree, Europe moved towards the Canadian uh, direction. They're all still uh, under the thrall of uh, point, point. Point system was never introduced in Germany, but uh, it's kind of pointless to have one because they arrive at the same level of openness without using points, but it still has this mythology of, 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 of the best system around. But the Canadians actually moved in the same time that uh, much of continental and, and uh, 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 English-speaking Europe moved in the Canadian direction. They moved in, into a continental uh, uh, European one uh, in, in Europe, uh, 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 in, in, in Canada, in Canada. Now this focus on temporary migration. Um, um, I, I, I go into that in a second. So the opposite move is from permanent to temporary migration as a preferred uh, migrant uh, to be recruited and to not to move away from pure human capital considerations where it's just enough to hold a diploma. That was the original idea of the point system. It's enough if, if you are a university graduate to, to get an immigration visa 
over the years, increasingly, um, to be admitted to Canada has been tied to having a job offer at hand, employment conditionality, uh, uh, one could call it. And, and that actually follows a neoliberal logic. I mean, also, already the point system, of course, is, is pure uh, uh, neoliberal logic, merit, merit and competition for talent, right? Uh, but um, uh, neoliberalism has so many uh, meanings and um, uh, features. One feature is that the state is, is less involved in certain uh, policy domains. And here, uh, if employment conditionality is increasingly um, important for being recruited as an immigrant, it means employers do the selection, employers rather than the state, yeah? So it's a way, it's in a way a sort of privatizing of, of the immigration function uh, that, that kicks in if you move from pure human capital to employment conditionality. <clears throat> the point system itself, um, its first version had a very holistic um, picture of the human person. And a human person is, is a social person. She is uh, with family. And initially, in the initial point system, there was the category of personal suitability that included, for example, if, if, if a candidate for an immigration visa already had relatives in Canada, that was a plus point because it was considered, uh, uh, well, uh, beneficial for, for her better adjustment uh, to, to the new country. And over time, this point system became denuded of these social personalistic elements uh, caught in the category of personal suitability, just skill, age, language, pang, pang, pang. The atomized individual uh, living up to Margaret Thatcher families that is in slash here in this uh, brutish um, can you still hear me because it says internet connection unstable but no, that, if that, I that, that was passed you were um, you were frozen for like three seconds okay very good um, yeah, uh, I will not uh, bother you with the detail here. Um, um, it, it, this point system, even as it was purified, neoliberal purified over time, um, had a lot of problems with it. Um, uh, this pure human capital logic leads to the fact that, you know, Okay, the border of Canada was made open to uh, nuclear physicists from India, say. Um, but then the professions in Canada built internal walls to make it very difficult for them to practice their profession. So their diplomas were enough to be granted an immigration visa, but they were not sufficient to allow them to work in their uh, fields in which they have expertise and skills. So I myself uh, experienced this bizarre uh, thing of uh, having a nuclear physicist uh, steering you in a taxi through the streets of Montreal. I will never forget that because it so much um, um, corresponded to, to, uh, to the uh, stereotype of all these high-skilled PhDs steering taxis because they are not allowed to uh, enter, uh, to, to, to practice their profession. Uh, okay, uh, so the Canadians then tried to fix that, of course, with recognizing the diplomas better, which was no easy thing because the whole um, associational uh, professional guilds had to be uh, worked on and uh, neutralized. And that hasn't actually fully succeeded until the present day. Um, an interesting development was the Canadian experience class visa introduced in 2007. Why is it interesting? Because that is the moment in which Canada shifted from a preference for permanent to temporary 
uh, uh, migrants. So what the Canadian experience class did is if people were already on a temporary work visa in Canada, then um, it's a two-step kind of system. Um, they got the possibility to render their residence status uh, uh, permanent. So uh, the Canadians uh, call it two-step migration. That's the European logic. The European logic, even after going into high-skilled recruitment, was always you don't get a permanent visa from day one, a permanent immigration visa. You get a temporary work visa, which can be renewed. But the renewal, to a degree, is in the discretion of the authorities. And in the meantime, you have to prove yourself uh, that you adjusted well, that you are still in employment and not a cost factor, uh, that you learned the language, there will be the civic, uh, uh, the civic testing uh, going on. Uh, and, and Canada uh, uh, now does the same thing. There's an interesting figure in the Dauvergne uh, roundabout view, uh, the end of settlement, this book, she says now more temporary migrants enter Canada than permanent migrants. It shifts the burden of adjustment from the state and from society to the individual. The individual has to prove herself. A vintage neoliberal um, um, uh, notion which is put into a practice here. And what the Canadian experience class further um, gives a premium on is um, Canadian degree holders. I know it, my own son actually who got a bachelor from uh, McGill and now doing a master program uh, in uh, somewhere else, it doesn't matter. He very easily got uh, a work visa for three years. Even now he can go back to Canada uh, just with a bachelor in political science to, to put to, to work there. They are very uh, progressive in enabling students who graduate from Canadian institutions uh, to, um, uh, to stay there um, and, 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 and to work there. Students are in a way the design neoliberal subjects, right? Generally, they pay for their studies. They have to find their own adjustment. Um, they, uh, so first they are fee paying, uh, that is good for the universities and, and they got adjusted and integrated in the meantime. And then they have the human capital that uh, Canada is looking for. Uh, that, that is uh, the golden route, uh, the student recruitment route. I wish I could go more into the student recruitment route because that has become so dramatically important, uh, not just for Canada, Australia, uh, but also for, for European countries. Okay, the express entry system is interesting from the point of view that um, the old human capital um, uh, point system uh, uh, scheme is still in operation, but if you have a job, then you are automatically pulled out of the pool of eligible uh, visa uh, uh, holders and uh, you are admitted uh, to Canada a job offer is required under this express entry system. If you don't have a job offer, you will languish in that uh, alligator pool, um, uh, perhaps forever, even though I understand after two years, this, these uh, point system based uh, pools are cleared and uh, composed anew. So there's a certain common trend if you now compare uh, Europe uh, with uh, 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 North America, Canada, call it a hybrid model that mixes human capital with employment criteria. Uh, um, the uh, mythologized uh, Canadian model is increasingly just uh, no longer Canadian, but uh, countries all do the same things in that respect. Okay, I'm at the Ah, no, I, I will not bother you with, fam with uh, fending off the bottom. Um, um, Grace, how many more minutes? I, th I, I know I'm bothering. No, no, hmm? it's, we're enjoying your talk. And if you can spend five minutes, for example, okay. to yeah, wrap up, that would be great. Oh, so we can have all right. time to discuss. All right. Um, now, <clears throat> if... Um, courting the top 
is directed at high-skilled migrants. And of course, the reverse logic, fending off the bottom, it should be low-skilled migrants for whom barricades are erected. Uh, um, that, however, is too easy. The story is more complex at the bottom um, because you have two different streams of the low-skilled. Um, you have a labor stream and you have um, a stream in which to be low skilled is more the presumption or the assumption made by states. It's not kind of determinative of, uh, of, the, uh, of the management of the flow. Um, I try to find my dam. Yeah, uh, so uh, a low skilled labor migration and most countries have um, uh, schemes for that. Here, the Martin Ruse number versus right logic already mentioned uh, fully applies. Temporariness is a structural feature. Rotation is being enforced today. Also because countries have learned from the 1960s uh, European experience to really <laughs> to build the buffers that uh, Europe at the time had kind of forgotten about or not known how to do, how to build them. You know, the fundamental problem here is the following. And Philip Martin, a labor economist from UC Davis has put it really in all desirable clarity. The fundamental issue is that migration is motivated by differences. And here he really means low skilled migration. He doesn't say it, but he means it. But migrant conventions, he means this noble IOM conventions, they call for equality. If migrants were truly equal in receiving countries, fewer would be demanded. This is so obvious. And uh, the migration uh, industry or uh, people by uh, card carrying liberals like myself, they totally are ignorant of this simple reality. You know, at the S4R, at this um, expert uh, committee, uh, the mantra is equal participation. Migrants, undifferentiated, not considering whether high skilled, low skilled, asylum or family, they are to be given the chance for equal participation. That's a bloody noble lie that totally um, um, ignores uh, the, uh, the Martin uh, wisdom here that the fundamental issue is that migration is motivated by differences, most importantly, pay differences, and also to a degree, treatment uh, differences. Okay. Um, if that's labor migration. In my book, I don't discuss that. I discuss uh, 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 low skilled migration where there's only the presumption that low skilled come in uh, which applies both to asylum and to family migration and i uh, discuss actually in my book and articles the family uh, uh, migration and i will not bother you with the detail here um, also here you have interesting symmetries between canada and europe that many people have not yet realized how how similar the defense building against against uh, uh, low-skilled people uh, on, the, on the family migration front is how similar that is uh, in, in Europe uh, to uh, the classic uh, immigration uh, countries. I will conclude because I see I stressed your patience. Now, never forget the restrictive uh, ground rule. Um, and I quote Catherine Duvernier here, it is impossible for immigration law to fully embrace a liberal paradigm because of its role in constituting, uh, constituting it should say here, not constitution, that's a typo, the border. Two, two messages out of that um, um, a story of immigration policies under a neoliberal uh, regime. 
the first message is and you cannot really understand that message uh, unless you, uh, you 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 read the detail uh, i just am the messenger to bring the message without fully contextualized being able to fully contextualize it the new nationalism and the populism that has started my whole inquiry has remained peripheral to immigration policy its logic both at the top and at the bottom is neoliberal. Its logic is to economize migration, look at it from the point of view of pure utility um, uh, for receiving societies, economizing migration, scaling down social justice uh, considerations. That's the main plank of neoliberalism that distinguishes it from uh, liberalism and uh, minimize uh, to a degree that it is liberally possible, of course, individual rights of uh, migrants. That's uh, message number one. Neoliberalism is the culprit, even for restrictiveness, uh, not uh, the populists. Message number two, there is convergence across rich societies. I would think not just transatlantic convergence, I, I mostly look at Canada, United States, Australia, and some European countries, but I would think South Korea, um, uh, Japan, um, uh, the Gulf states uh, to a degree, uh, they have the same uh, binary um, uh, that I described here in this talk and, and, and in the scribbles. Uh, uh, Canada is no longer the exceptional model that all liberals have to imitate because a lot of restrictive nastiness is practiced there, European style, for a long time already. If there's one future, one always finishes it correctly, what are the desirables for future research? That's kind of the sermon of finishing a paper to a degree, finishing a book. I always hated that. But to me, it's it's really a desirable. And, and my, my current research is now totally away from immigration and um, um, citizenship. Uh, I know really uh, I grasp uh, the animal by its horn. And I'm writing a book about the political forms of neoliberalism. Um, across the board and trying to uh, map the distinction between liberalism and neoliberalism. Uh, um, and it, 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 however, staying in that field of immigration and citizenship, I think uh, future research should really look more carefully into whether um, neoliberalism and populism or new nationalism whether they are antagonistic forces this is how they popped up in 2016 brexit and trump was seen as a populist new nationalist response to too much globalization too much free trade too much cosmopolitanism of the elites uh, uh, well you know all that spiel um, and a main frame really of interpreting this resurgence of right-wing populism is it's a counterforce to globalization, to neoliberalism, because neoliberalism is, of course, the main ideology undergirding the globalization. But if you look deeper, if you scrap deeper, there are interesting parallels um, between both movements, forces, principles. Um, they are really complementary. And... Uh, uh, in, in my book, I see it uh, when I look at uh, uh, Denmark, an interesting small country which has about the harshest uh, immigration and asylum and citizenship rules of, of all Western rich societies. And um, the populists there who have been driving that to a degree No, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Yeah, I uh, clicked this damn thing here and, uh, okay. Um, the populists kicking off this nasty restrictive trend in Denmark were speaking neoliberal language. They say migrants 
who contribute, who work, they are fine. All those who don't contribute, who don't work, who are a cost factor to society should stay out. So populists in Denmark, they don't speak this brute on Boden. Uh, of course, they have this thing about true Danish is to be Christian and Lutheran to a degree, but that's, that's not their main language. Their main language is neoliberal language. And uh, in that respect, uh, that is a case in which uh, neoliberalism and, and populism are complementary and uh, not antagonistic. And, and, and this requires much more further attention under what conditions these forces are opposite forces as they are really meant to be and often present themselves and in which other constellations uh, they, they share one bed. <laughs> okay, um, I, I, I have finished. <laughs> Thank you, Krishna. Um, that's, uh, uh, I think it's a very engaging talk and I think it's also very informative. And I, in fact, the reason I, I really recommend your book to everybody I, I met was because it's, first of all, it's the first chapter you wrote about neoliberalism. Um, I thought it was, wow, that's a very concise explanation of uh, that. So thank you very much and thank you for the talk. We do 